Thomas Jefferson said the U.S. Constitution should expire when the last founder died. And it's also true that George Washington expected the Constitution to last no more than 20 years. Now, what if they were right? What if the Constitution did expire? What would happen today with the political upheaval that's taking place in America, with both sides relying on the Constitution to justify their positions? A new political thriller imagines what might happen if the United States had to hammer out a whole new constitution today. Who would we entrust to that monumental task? Who is today's George Washington or Benjamin Franklin, James Madison, or Thomas Jefferson? What would happen to our country if indeed our treasured constitution was no longer in force? That's our topic today with John Boykin, author of the new political thriller, the Constitution has expired. So stay with us. Welcome to Lean to the Left, home of no holds barred commentary, plus interviews with fascinating people, some of them top experts, others simply with interesting stories to tell. You'll never know who'll show up at Lean to the Left. Now, here's your host, Bob Gaddy. Something had been troubling John Boykin for decades. If the American form of government was the best in the world, why didn't other countries emulate it? And while the U.S. Constitution was proving nearly impossible to even amend, emerging countries were writing their own constitutions from scratch. What if the U.S. had to do that all over again? This became the premise of the Constitution has expired. Though the book is fiction, Boykin researched it as carefully as his award-winning nonfiction books. His nonfiction book, One Brief Miracle, told the inside story of American diplomat Philip Habib's mission to stop the 1982 Israeli siege of Beirut. Former Secretary of State George Shultz wrote the foreword, and the book won the American Academy of Diplomacy Book Award under its hardcover title, Cursed is the Peacemaker. You can learn more about both books at AppleGateLLC.com. John, thanks for joining us today. I truly appreciate it. Thank you, buddy. Happy to be here. Now, the Constitution has expired. Starts out with a young woman studying the original of the Constitution at the National Archives in Washington, D.C., and discovering, unbelievably, that Article 5 contained a sentence stating that the Constitution would expire a hundred years after its establishment, something that no one had ever noticed before. Now, that would mean that the Constitution, as we know it, is no longer in force, having expired in the mid-1800s. What would be the implications of that, John? Be unthinkable. It's unimaginable happen. And that's exactly what made this an interesting book to write, yeah. because I wanted to see if I could think through the unthinkable. Mm -hmm. What would happen for sure is a contest between chaos and inertia. Chaos, because nobody would know what to do. Mm -hmm. And inertia, because we tend to assume, oh, we'll just muddle through. This thing has been there. The Constitution has been there for so long mm -hmm. that we have no concept of, of what else we would do. Yeah. Who would be in charge? Are the laws still valid? Is the money still good? Are we still a country? Is it the same 50 states? It would be it would be chaos on steroids. Wow. You say there are three key failings of the Constitution, John. What are they? I'll give you four. The first is quick and simple. They made it nearly impossible to amend. Uh -huh. It's the oldest constitution, not because it's the best, but because it's virtually impossible to amend. And the second is states as a unit of measurement for most other things, voting for governor, voting for mayor, voting for propositions on the ballot. Individual voters are the unit of measurement. But for the federal government, states are the unit of measurement. And I understand why they did that in 1787, but it makes no sense anymore. Wyoming has 600,000 uh, people. Mm -hmm. California has 40 million people. Mm 
both states get two votes in the U.S. Senate. And what we're uh, watching in the presidential election that's going on right now is somebody's trying to win a state. Exactly why does it make sense to win a state? Exactly why should two states called Iowa and New Hampshire pretty much determine who's going to be the nominee? The Constitution sets up states as the unit of measurement. Uh, The third thing, so the first is virtually impossible to amend. The second is states as a unit of measurement. Mm -hmm. The third is political parties. You cannot talk about federal government or politics for 30 seconds without mentioning Democrats and Republicans. And yet the Constitution is absolutely stone silent about political parties. There is not a syllable anywhere in the Constitution about political parties, what they can do, what they have to do, how they should interrelate, what their limitations are, nothing about it. Because, and that's not the founder's fault, when they wrote the Constitution in 1787, there was no such thing as a political party. They came along a few years later, but it's Mm -hmm. never been amended to address political parties. And the fourth thing, so there's hard to amend, uh, states as a unit of measurement, political parties, And the fourth is there's no referee. What we have is a rule book for an individual sport like tennis or golf, when in fact, government is a team sport like basketball or football. And the Constitution doesn't (laughs) talks about the teams. Um, And there's no referee. The players are free to make up the rules as they go Mm. or break them or ignore them. Probably the most notable example was four years ago when, or no, I guess it was eight years ago, when President Obama nominated a Supreme Court justice, Merrick Garland, Mm -hmm. and the majority leader of the Senate, an office that does not exist in the Constitution, decided, no, we're not going to take it up. Yeah, We'll just not do that. So the players get to make up the rules as they go because there's no referee. That's an interesting point. Never thought about that. So and we like to think that the Supreme Court is the referee, and in a yeah. certain very limited sense, they are. But how long ago was the 2000 election? And the Supreme Court is only now getting around to deciding whether a foul was committed. Can you imagine a football game yeah. uh, with no referee on the field calling fouls as they happen? Yeah. Yeah. And the Supreme Court, unfortunately, has become political. It shouldn't be, but it is. Oh, yeah. I mean, it's a joke. Yeah. Uh, when you can predict with about 80%, 90% certainty how a Supreme Court justice is going to rule on a given case, yeah. <laughs> then that's not the kind of person you should have serving on the Supreme Court. No, exactly right. How has the Constitution been eviscerated by partisanship, do you think? The founders had one piece of absolute genius, and that was the idea of checks and balances. The problem is that since this was 1787, before political parties arose, they counted on institution A to be a check and balance on institution B. So like the Congress and and the president and the the, uh, Supreme Court Mm -hmm. or the judiciary being a check and balance as institutions. And that works fine until you introduce political parties into the mix, Mm -hmm. at which point it gets all but thrown out the window. Mm -hmm. For example, was there ever any doubt that the Democrat led House of Representatives was going to impeach Donald Trump four years ago. No. Mm-hmm. Was there any ever any doubt that the Republican Senate was going to acquit him? No. Right. Because of the part because their partisan allegiances took priority over any sense of checks and balances. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Now section three of the 14th Amendment states that no person can serve in political office if they had engaged in insurrection or rebellion against the United States. Now, do you believe that should prevent Donald Trump from seeking the presidency? It prevents him from occupying the presidency. Mm -hmm. And one of the tragedies of the uh, Supreme Court ruling that came down on March 5th Mm -hmm. 
mm-hmm. about his eligibility under the 14th Amendment right. was they completely missed the point of Section 3. I, I think March 5th marks the official formal death of the pretense of originalism that has become an article of faith among candidates for or, or, uh, prospective nominees for the Supreme Court. They stood Section 3 on its head. Mm-hmm. I would encourage everybody to actually read the, the full text of Section 3 of the 14th Amendment. No, because people usually stop reading about halfway through. Mm-hmm. The most important sentence is the last sentence. Section 3 doesn't define how you determine whether somebody engaged in insurrection or not. It, it just assumes. Mm-hmm. But the, the final sentence says, but Congress may, by a vote of two-thirds of each house, remove such disability. So the text of it only addresses how to remove the disability or the ineligibility. And the Supreme Court just stood that on its head by saying, oh, Congress has to basically declare that Donald Trump engaged in insurrection in order to render him ineligible, which is exactly the opposite of what it says. Is this an example of how Trump has stacked the Supreme Court in his favor? Oh, absolutely. And you, the founders set up the Supreme Court justices to have lifetime tenure. The theory was that that would make them independent mm-hmm. and free them from political influence. But when Supreme Court justice are, justices are chosen precisely for their ideology, mm-hmm then independence becomes academic. Nobody needs to put political pressure on Samuel Alito or uh, Clarence Thomas right. to get them to vote a particular way on a, on a particular case <laughs> from their ideology, how they're going to vote. Right. And so, yeah, Donald Trump stacked it in his favor and they have already started serving him well. Yeah, that's for sure. All right. In your book, you're critical of both political parties. Does that mean you don't believe in the two-party system? And if not, what's your solution? There's no such thing as a two-party system. That is a myth that has grown up over the years because we have generally had two parties and they have made sure that no third or fourth parties can get on the stage. The founders who wrote the Constitution gave us Mm -hmm. a no-party system because they didn't have political parties then. George Washington took office with no opposition. James Monroe was elected president with no opposition. Uh, If you've heard of the era of good feelings, there was basically one political party or more accurately, no political parties at that time. It is true that we have usually had uh, two political parties and they have reified their stranglehold on politics. But it's profoundly harmful. All of the incentives are conducive to making people more extreme rather than more cooperative. And that's a tragedy for the country. Yeah, that's been that that extremism has been growing in recent years. And I remember I'm up in years and I worked on Capitol Hill in the 70s, in the late 70s. And I worked for both a Republican and then I worked for a Democratic member of the House of Representatives. I was chief of staff for both. And my recollection of those days is that my bosses were able to work with members of the other party easily to reach a conclusion that really was intended at least to be in the best interest of with the majority of the people. Yeah. That's not the case today. They no. don't do that. No. And it's just incredible to me. I think the prevailing assumption is that politicians are are in it for power. Yeah. And I think that is only a part of uh, that's only partly true. It certainly is the case in, in a lot of uh, often, but power is only a means to an end. You want power so that you can accomplish something. Yeah. You can get some kind of policy through or something. The The prevailing imperative is not really power per se. It's asses in chairs. It's how do I keep my ass in my chair? <laughs> how, how can I get enough money to keep my ass in my chair? 
Uh-huh. How can I get my ass in a better chair? That is the game. I've never heard it put that way, but, <laughs> <laughs> but it's a fact. <laughs> Asses in chair. <laughs> it's not even money. There, there's a lot of concern about bribery, and and the you know the founders were concerned about bribery. Mm-hmm. Um, and bribery assumes that oh, I, I politician me, I'm going to get money for something, but that's the most effective kind of bribery now is is not I will give you dollar bills, but I will run ads on your behalf mm-hmm. so that you can keep your ass in your chair. I will I will donate money to your campaign. I yeah. will do this and that all so that you can keep your ass in your chair. <laughs> I live in Myrtle Beach, South Carolina. And <laughs> the ads here when Nikki Haley was up until the South Carolina Republican primary. Yeah. Nikki Haley had some really good ads, I thought. And one of them was all about <laughs> keeping your ass in your chair. And it was it started a chicken. And the only thing that in this ad was just a chicken going across the screen. Going and the voiceover said that Trump was a chicken because he wouldn't debate Nikki Haley. And of course that was her effort to keep her ass in her chair or get her ass in the chair. (laughs) Then Trump came back with a counter ad also with a chicken. The same, the chicken looked just like Nikki Haley's chicken. (laughs) And his ad was put a fork in her (laughs) because she's done. (laughs) And it was just a chicken. I just thought it was a scream. Absolutely every single thing about how somebody becomes president is ridiculous. Yeah. We're so, we're so used to it that we never give it a second thought. Yeah. The, uh, in 1800, the political campaign, but the presidential campaign between John Adams and Thomas Jefferson yeah. consisted of John Adams giving a speech. Giving Thomas what? Jefferson wrote some letters. Okay. That was the presidential campaign in 1800. And now right. it's this massive, grotesque, obscene oh, machine. Yeah. Oh, and yeah. whatever it takes to win. And by win, it's not... I, I frankly ignore any poll that I see of national sentiment because the only sentiment that really matters is in the battleground states. Mm-hmm. Uh, I live in California. The Democrat is going to win the state of California, period. Doesn't matter who it is. In Wyoming, the Republican is going to win. Doesn't Mm -hmm. matter who it is. Yeah, and that's how it is in South Carolina, too. Yeah. Yeah. And and the value of your vote depends on where you live. Uh And if you are a Republican in California, your vote for president quite literally does not count. Mm -hmm. If you are a Democrat, in uh, Wyoming, your vote for president quite literally does not count. Yeah. Uh, your vote counts only if you are in a battleground state, which, which is defined as more or less 50-50. Mm-hmm. And that's where the candidates devote the vast majority of their energy mm-hmm. trying to get a few more votes here or a few more votes there can tip the balance because we have this ridiculous system called winner take all. 48 out of the 50 states have a winner-take-all system. And so if you get, uh, I'm not sure it even has to be a majority, even a plurality, you get 100% of the electoral votes. Why? Because the Constitution created this cockamamie thing called the Electoral College that no generation has ever had the wherewithal to abolish. Yeah, I wanted to get into the Electoral College and, and ask you, why is it that let the voters decide is just heartwarming humbug that ignores the <laughs> electoral college. <laughs> and thanks for feeding me that line, that that <laughs> heartwarming humbug line. I really like. <laughs> it's not. It's it certainly is the way it should be, and mm. it's heartwarming because it's the way it should be. We would all. We've all been told a thousand times every vote counts. Right. Well, actually, every vote does not count. Yeah. Um, unless you live in the right place. You, Bob Getty, and I do not elect a president. 
right. president is elected by the electoral college, which right. is 538 people that nobody knows who they are. Right. Nobody knows how they got those assignments. Mm. They're not really accountable to anybody. Mm. They never meet as a total group. The electoral college was a last minute compromise by the founders at the Constitutional Convention. They looked at various ways that the president might get, take office and they didn't like any of them, but they settled on the Electoral College as, as James Madison put it, as the one liable to the fewest objections. And it was explicitly uh, a compromise to the slave holding uh, states. In one of his writings, I think it was Federalist 10, James Madison says in so many words, it was on account of the Negroes because they couldn't vote in the Southern states. Mm -hmm. And so if you had a straight popular vote for president, then what do you do about slaves who are not allowed to vote? And do you right. count them in one way, but not in another way? Mm -hmm. And so the Electoral College is absolutely a child of the slavery system. We managed to abolish slavery in the 1860s, but no generation has ever gotten around to abolishing its child, the Electoral College. We almost did uh, 50 years ago. It was the closest we've ever come. Mm -hmm. But it got filibustered by a couple of segregationist senators. And you know, the filibuster is not in the Constitution. So we could talk about that. But the Electoral College is an abomination. And everything in the news in this election year, everything is because of this ridiculous thing called the Electoral College. Subtract that, and the news would be much less. That, and you wouldn't have, Trump wouldn't have had the, uh, Trump and his supporters wouldn't have had the, uh, what they consider to be the option to um, send alternate electors. Yeah. Yeah. Which is, um, you know, was their strategy to overturn the election? Hey, use these electors, not the ones that are legit, but use our electors. Yeah. Whether right? you like Donald Trump or you hate him, the fact is that his energies are 100% targeted on the Electoral College. Yeah. He has made no effort that I'm aware of to appeal to the American people as a whole. He has made no, expressed no interest in being the president of the American people as a whole. He's very much interested in being the head of his cult of personality. The thing about, to go back to the idea of let the people decide, let the people yeah. vote. If it were our decision to make who the president is, Donald Trump would never have gotten in the White House in the first place. That's true. The American people have voted against him twice. Mm -hmm. One time, enough of them lived in the right places mm -hmm. to keep the Electoral College from handing it to him. Mm -hmm. And the first time, there were enough people living in the right places that the Electoral College did hand it to him. Mm -hmm. The only thing that makes sense is, for, you know, given our presidential system, is a straight popular vote like we have for pretty much every other office under the sun. But you cannot, you virtually cannot amend the Constitution because the founders made it so hard. That's a really a good point. And if you would think that the most important office in the land would be chosen by popular vote. Every other school board members are chosen by popular vote. Yep. County commissioners are popular vote. Dog yep. catchers, if there's any place where a dog catcher is elected. It's incredible. And yet the president of the United States is elected through this cockamamie, crazy system that has all these holes and doesn't really. My wife says to me, why should I vote? It's the Electoral College that's going to elect this guy or not. Why should I vote? How do you answer that question? Her vote matters only if she lives in the right place. Now, yeah. I don't have an, the, the list of, of battlegrounds, battleground states changes uh, over time. So I'm not sure whether South Carolina is considered a battleground state now no, or not. No, it's not. It's not. Okay. In that case, no, her vote does not matter. Yeah. Um, my vote in California does not matter. If you, if however you live in one of those battleground states like Michigan or Pennsylvania or whoever the current ones are, Georgia, um, then your vote counts very much because you, my friend, are voting on steroids. 
Yeah. Your vote counts for exponentially more than mine does. Oh, wait a minute now. If you vote in California, your vote counts if you vote for the Democrat, right? Yes, but it is it is 100% predictable that the right. Democrat is going to win right. in California, whether right. I vote for him or not. So in that, camp, that Senate race, which is what? Adam Schiff against now Steve Garvey, the, yeah. f- the former baseball player. Yeah. Garvey doesn't have a prayer, right? No, because it's a statewide election. And the, yeah. the only reason it's down to those two is because the Democratic vote was split uh-huh. between Adam Schiff and I'm not trying to remember her name, Katie Porter. Katie Porter would have been very good. Uh-huh. Adam Schiff would be very good. Uh-huh. But it split the vote. It split the Democratic vote. And Garvey got the most quantity, got the largest quantity of votes. But that's mm-hmm. because the Democrats are split between two. In the general election, no, it's Garvey doesn't have a prayer. Oh, okay. Okay. That's really good to hear anyway. <laughs> <laughs> now, that said. Not that we want to be has... political here or anything like that. But <laughs> <laughs> Now, that said. California has sent uh, Republicans to the Senate before, and mm-hmm. it, it will, it, and it will again. It's yeah. just not going to happen this year. Yeah. Okay. All right. How has your research into the Constitution affected your view of government dysfunction? It has shown me that the government dysfunction is directly attributable to the Constitution. Okay. All of this dysfunction is not despite the Constitution. It is because of the inadequacies of the Constitution, the the difficulty of, of amending it. The Electoral College has profoundly warped and perverted our politics from the beginning. Anyway, when I started, I when I started my research on this, I expected that it was going to deepen my appreciation for the genius of the Constitution. After all, that's the term that you hear all the time about the Constitution. Oh, the genius of the founders, the genius of this, the genius of that. Much to my surprise, I did not find very much genius in there. What I found was a lot of things that are the reason for our dysfunction today. And so I, I came to realize that the problem is the Constitution. Now, that's easy for me to say. What do you do about that? It's like a bad parent. We're stuck with it. Mm-hmm. Like it or not, for better or for worse, it's what we're stuck with. Yeah. So we need to make the best of it. But one reason I wanted to write this book was to jar people's thinking enough from just the myopic focus on the way things presently are to what if it weren't that way? What if it were some other way? Suppose we did this instead of that. Suppose we did things this way instead of that way. And I don't imagine that my book is going to be the blueprint for the next constitution of the United States, although it should be. But I think it should be too. but. (laughs) (laughs) But I hope that smarter political minds than than mine will take it and come up with better ideas than I came up with. Yeah. Okay. I want to talk a little bit more about your book. Now, the subtitle is a novel, really, probably. What the hell is that all about? (laughs) When I've gone to parties and gatherings and and talked to people about, I'm writing this book called The Constitution Has Expired. Invariably, Uh somebody over there will say, it has. And (laughs) I I have to say, it's a novel. It it really hasn't. But so I felt like I needed to say it's a novel. But the more I researched it, the more plausible it became. I thought I was having the Constitution expire. I thought that was this crazy idea that I pulled out of thin air. And I did. But Mm -hmm. as it turns out, if it had expired, if -hmm. there had been uh, an expiration clause built into it, we would not be at all surprised. It would be completely consistent with uh, other things that were known uh, about it uh, back then. For example, Jefferson, I I think he quoted, uh, said that it should last only until the last founder died. Washington said in so many words, I don't expect it to last more than more than 20 years. Mm -hmm. The this the Constitution was written in 1787. The Declaration of Independence was only 11 years earlier. 
the Articles of Confederation, which was uh, the previous equivalent of a constitution, was only six years old. Mm -hmm. The oldest state constitution at that point was only 13 years old. So there's no reason to think that the founders imagined that this thing was going to last forever. They had no more crystal ball than you and I did. We treat them as though they had the, they were these glorious visionaries. Yeah. They did have a lot of theories yeah. of if we do this, then that will be incentive for that to happen. And they were right about some of them, and they were dead wrong about others. And they mm. disagreed about those all the time. The yeah. fact that they wound up settling on this theory instead of that theory doesn't mean that it was right. It's just yeah. the compromise they made. You picked the idea of of having this young girl who I guess she had some kind of hyperlexia. Yeah, is that what it was? Hyper hyperlexia. Yeah. At any rate, she was really smart. She focused on on this. She read the original while she was standing there with people all around her trying to get her to move and everything. And she spotted the, this sentence that said that the Constitution would expire a hundred years after it was enacted. Yeah. And, and no one had ever seen that before. How did you come up with the idea of using somebody like her to set the stage for this whole book? The idea of the discrepancy between the handwritten Constitution that the founders actually signed yeah. and the, the printed one that people have been reading ever since. Right. That was at the beginning of, of the concept. The fact is that there were, if you're familiar with the term version control, it's a big problem in the technology world, I can promise you. There was a, there was a calligrapher who was writing the text of the Constitution by hand on parchment for mm -hmm. the founders to actually sign with a quill, pen, and ink. Okay. There was also a printer who was doing a printed copy that would they wouldn't have to take home with it. The minute they signed the Constitution parchment, it got rolled up and put in a dark closet. And it stayed in various dark closets for 137 years. Nobody ever compared the two. After the Constitutional Convention adjourned, nobody ever sat down and compared the two. Mm -hmm. And my idea was suppose they had put it into the original parchment that they signed mm -hmm. and through some kind of oversight it just didn't make it into the printed one mm -hmm. and so that's the scenario that is the premise for the whole mm -hmm. book and a good chunk of the book book is dedicated to teasing out how that could actually happen and i i needed it to be plausible and mm -hmm. the best way i know to make something plausible is to make it actual and so I researched all of this very carefully, down to the smell of the ink that the okay. um, that the calligrapher used. Right. And if it's, I, I certainly took liberties with the facts, but it's very plausible this could have happened. Yeah. And so I just play out, okay, what if it had? Well, I think it's a remarkable thing that that you take a concept like that and turn it into a novel really based on, you can't say based on fact, but based on what could be fact. And I found it to be extremely well done and interesting and highly recommend you guys, if you can pick this book up, you should. And that reminds me, where can people find it? Uh, it's on Amazon right now. Okay. Uh, there's information about it at constitutionnovel.com. If you go into uh Amazon and look for the Constitution has expired. Mm -hmm. um, it's there as paperback, as an ebook, and as an audiobook. Yeah, you just did the audiobook, right? It will be on other places later, but right now it's only on Amazon. Okay, excellent. And the book was published first of March, right? Yes. So it's brand new out. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. All right. Like I said, guys, if you have a chance, check it out and pick it up. If you're interested in history, if you're interested in current affairs, if you're interested in politics, all those things, check it out. So have you got anything else you'd like to add, John? Yeah, I would just add that this is not a civics lesson. Yeah. The book is not 
It's not a political screed. It's not a mm-hmm. civics lesson. It deals with government and politics, but it's a novel. Yeah. And a novelist's first job is to entertain. Yeah. And if you don't write an entertaining story, then nothing else matters. Yeah. Now, it so happens that there are some real significant issues that the book touches on. Mm-hmm. But the news is not a civics lesson in government. The news is stories. And so yeah. this is very this book, The Constitution Has Expired, is very much a a story of characters grappling with an unthinkable crisis. And okay. how do they do it? How do they work through it? What do they come up with? Mm-hmm. Why that? And that's that was the fun of writing it. And frankly, for me, it was an escape from the real world of all the horrible things going on in, in government and politics today. This was, for me, very much an escape into, call it a fantasy, but Mm -hmm. it's it's grounded in facts and reality. Okay. John, thanks so much for joining us on the Lean to Left podcast. I really did enjoy talking to you about this. And as I said before, you guys, pick this book up. It's well worth your time. It's a good book. Thanks. Thank you, Bob. Hey guys, thanks for watching. I hope you enjoyed this Lean to the Left video and you found it interesting and informative. Please visit on a regular basis and check out our interviews with guests on topics that focus on progressive politics and the important social issues of our time. Now our interview shows stream on Mondays with special episodes on Thursdays. And you can check out upcoming shows, guests and topics at podcast.leantotheleft.net. Subscribe to our audio version there and to our video shows here at YouTube. And follow us on social media, Facebook at Bob Gaddy and the Lean to the Left podcast. Now it's two. Bob Gaddy is one Facebook page and the Lean to the Left podcast is a second Facebook page. Twitter at Lean to the Left one. Instagram at Lean to the Left one. TikTok at at Lean to the Left, LinkedIn at Bob Gaddy, and YouTube at Lean to the Left. Now, I hope you'll support Lean to the Left as well so we can keep things going. Just click on the Donate tab at the top of the leantotheleft.net homepage and contribute by buying me a cup of coffee. That'll really help and would be much, much, much appreciated. Now, this is Bob Gaddy signing off for Lean to the Left. Thanks for sharing your time with us.